Welcome to Perspectives of Global Justice. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Is climate change real or a hoax? In 2013, a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations body charged with reaching a consensus view on global warming suggests that scientists are essentially 100% certain that global warming is an occurring factor and 95% certain that it's a man-made process. President Trump administration does not have a science advisor and relied on climate change skeptics for guidance on energy and environmental policy issues. On March 28th, President Trump signed a sweeping executive order that calls for the Environmental Protection Agency to review the Clean Power Plan with an eye towards eliminating it. The new Environmental Executive Order eliminates a metric for assessing the economic effects of the carbon dioxide emissions known as the social cost of carbon, rethinks how policymakers consider climate change, and encourages the U.S. fossil fuel production, along with new promises, new jobs, restoration of economic freedom, and more prosperity for our nation. Hopefully, the new executive orders will take years to be replaced. Until then, states can still continue to move toward clean energy, but they will lose major federal incentives to do so. Lucky for the state of Hawaii, we have Blue Planet Foundation, which is led by a very experienced and advocate in the fearless leader, leader uh, Jeff Mikulina. Blue Planet Foundation is a champion organization that has created policies and programs to transform Hawaii's energy systems to clean, renewable energy solutions. More than ever, Blue Planet Foundation remains committed to lead the way for global change by using awareness, education, advocacy and a lot of love for the earth to remove the obstacles that stand between us and a future free from fossil fuel. Today's Perspective on Global Justice welcomes guest Shem Lalor, Clean Transportation Director of Blue Planet Foundation. Well, welcome to our show, Shem. Beatrice, it's good to be here. Yes. So, uh, for our viewers who do not know about Blue Planet Foundation, could you give us a little overview of uh, this beautiful organization? Sure. Uh, so, Blue Planet Foundation was founded back in 2007 by Hank Rogers. He's a uh, well-known um, in Hawaii for he's he's famous for uh, developing video games such as Tetris and and other games. Uh, he also owns a, a number of other companies. Uh, Blue Planet Foundation is a nonprofit that he he started. And our mission is basically to get Hawaii off of fossil fuels. And uh, uh, what was uh, the main driver for saying, hey, let's switch gears. Let's not use fossil fuel energy anymore and consider a green energy alternatives? Well, I think, I think uh, there's a lot of evidence, uh, obviously, that uh, climate change is happening. And uh, I think for Hank Rogers uh, in particular, he became very concerned about uh, the impacts of, of global climate change on Hawaii's uh, coral reefs and on the, the shoreline due to uh, rising uh, sea levels. So we obviously as an island state, we are right in the, in the line of fire for uh, some of the major impacts of global warming. Mm -hmm. So uh, Blue Planet Foundation is well known uh, for its uh, strong policy making uh, advocacy work <coughs> and also a lot of programs that's implemented here in the state to make that happen. Do you mind giving a little bit of an um, overview, a timeline since 2007 uh, worked, you know, we have been able to accomplish as a state? Uh, sure. Uh, so, like, like I mentioned, uh, we were founded in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of advocacy, a lot of education. Uh, we've been advocating for uh, incentives for the solar industry, wind industry. Uh, for several years, we fought to get um, a uh, re uh, renewable portfolio standard uh, that would see us to 100% clean energy. We actually got that passed in 2015. That was our bill. Mm -hmm. uh, it took several years, but we got it passed in 2015. And that, as, as most of uh, the viewers will probably know, by 2045, all of 100% of Hawaii's electricity sector will be renewable, renewably powered. Uh, so that was a major landfall victory for us uh, two years ago. Uh, now we've kind of turned a lot of our attention uh, from the electricity sector, which we've made a lot of progress to the uh, transportation sector where we have not made a lot of progress, which also consumes a almost a, a comparable amount, about the same amount of energy as, as electricity sector. 
uh, we haven't made a lot of progress there, and that's where we're really kind of focusing our efforts at this time. I'm sorry, I'm so excited that, you know, to have you here to, today so we can talk a little bit about it. Uh, do you know, like on average, uh, how much percent of fossil fuel energy do we use for transportation for the state of Hawaii per year? Sure. So of our total uh, oil imports, about 28% is used for electricity sector, and about 27 or 28 percent is used for the ground transportation sector. The remainder is, is split between air traffic. Air, air is about uh, 25 or 26 percent, mm -hmm. and then the, the rest is for military and, and marine and those kind of things. So the, big, the really two big chunks is, is ground transportation and electricity. Like I said, we've done a lot, we had a lot of progress on the electricity sector. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on the ground transportation sector. The other big piece would be aviation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit uh, of a difficult one for us to handle locally because aviation is, is much more of, a, of an international issue. It's not as easy for us to, to make changes um, on a local level, mm -hmm. but that's maybe an, an, uh, a later project. No, so for now, really, ground transportation is what we're It's nice eyeing. to have that uh, large, you know, long-term vision for, trans for trans transportation and aviation. But uh, for now, with transportation, mm -hmm. I hear that we have uh, a new bill uh, being considered by our Senate uh, House. Uh, so HB 1580. Uh, for our viewers who have never heard about this bill, what it is all about and uh, what are we trying to accomplish if we have it uh, passed and uh, implemented into law? Sure. So, uh, yeah, H uh, House Bill 1580, HP 1580, uh, is, a, is a bill that is a little bit different from the one we passed in 2015, which was a mandate, which is a, basically all of electricity has to be 100% renewable. This one, uh, HB 1580, would set a goal to have all of our ground transportation powered by renewable uh, power. Uh, it's, a, it's not a mandate, and the reason why we've strategically not done a mandate is because uh, the electricity sector has a very limited number of actors. You have you know, the utilities and, and a, a few other, uh, uh, a small set of power companies, basically. With ground transportation, you have literally millions of actors. You have individuals who purchase cars. And so it's a little bit more difficult to have a mandate and to, to uh, have a body that could officiate over that. Um, so we've uh, decided to, to go with more of a, of a goal, a, uh, a target, if you will, that would have us 100% renewable ground transportation by 2045. Same year, same uh, target year as the electricity sector, but just a goal. And basically what we're trying to achieve by this is... Uh, to start getting everybody's mind focused on the same end game. Um, we don't necessarily, we're not saying we're going to take away people's uh, gasoline car, though I'm sure there'll be some people who have a, you know, a classic 1969 Corvette in the year 2045. We're not trying to take that away from We're people. not going to convert it into we, like... We definitely <laughs> could, but uh, what we're really trying to do is is get all the car dealerships to think, okay, by 2030, 2035, all of our cars will be electric that we're going to be selling. Mm -hmm. We want the condominium uh, uh, associations to start thinking, oh, well, we actually need to start developing a plan to install charging in our building because, you know, 2045, all the cars are going to be electric or hydrogen. So we really want people's mindset to change, This, but we're telling them this is where we're going mm -hmm. and we need to start planning for that. And that's where we think the value of the, of the target is, is to really get everybody on the same page, start planning the infrastructure that we need, start planning the, um, uh, all the little tweaks we're going to need to make in the transportation system and infrastructure mm -hmm. that we, mm -hmm. need, we need to do. Uh, the sooner we start planning for the thing, those things, the smoother our transition is going to be. Absolutely. And I'm so happy that we have an urban planner in you uh, as a background, uh, you know, to be able to actually bring our state, you know, to that frame of uh, vision. I mean, ideally that we could hit the moon, but, you know, if we aim at the stars and get there, that's amazing too. So um, where are we at in terms of uh, our transportation situation for the state of Hawaii? Uh, give uh, us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We, uh, well, it's, it's pretty bad and ugly is where we're mm -hmm. at. Um, we, uh, we have pretty good geographical gifts in terms of sustainable transportation. We have limited driving range because we're islands. Um, 
our good climate should mean that we could walk and bike a lot and that we mm -hmm. could even our dry our, our electric vehicles perform well in warm weather so on in what we have in terms of geographical and climactic gifts we could be doing a lot unfortunately we have built cities and islands that are really dependent on the personal automobile which uses a lot of energy and a lot of space and mm -hmm. The, because we've invested so much and built everything around the car, uh, we really don't have um, capacity and service quality in alternative modes of transportation like public transit, and walking and biking. And so we really have a long way to go. Well, basically about 80% of all the trips in the state are by personal automobiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just don't have the quality in alternative modes that we should have. So we have to make a lot of, uh, of ground there. And then we, we actually are doing quite well when it comes to EVs or electric vehicles compared to other states. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is because we don't have, uh, because of our, we have island states and we don't drive as far, mm -hmm. uh, the range anxiety, which is one of the major barriers to electric vehicle adoption, has not been as big of a problem. So we've had a lot of people that have purchased EVs. Uh, comp, you know, the ratio is higher than most other states, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we still have a long way to go. Still, EVs just make up about half of 1% of all the cars on the road mm -hmm. today. So, um, for someone who wants to be uh, more of an ally and, and uh, really do that transition and say, I wanted to buy an EV car, mm -hmm. I want to utilize uh, public transportation more, also, mm -hmm. also the bike, um, but then you have to consider the cost, uh, the initial cost uh, aspect of buying a new car, and now with the new executive orders that just been you know, put in effect and that does not support green energy, actually supports fossil fuel energy and then most of the state incentives that people perhaps would, uh, you know, have to be able to do that transition uh, may not be there. What would be your advice uh, for somebody to start with small steps or even to plan, uh, you know, maybe, you know, two, three years from now to start transitioning more towards right. that? Well, uh, that's a really good question. So as you mentioned, we, the current administration we have in Washington is, uh, is not one that we can expect to rely on for leadership on clean energy or clean transportation. Uh, they have, uh, there's a lot of skepticism in the administration about global warming and about renewable energy and, and clean transportation technologies. Uh, the good news is that um, the market, where the market is developed, both on clean energy like uh, solar energy and wind and as also for uh, electric vehicles has advanced far enough where I, I don't think we necessarily need um, or I, I should say I don't think that the administration can really thwart the progress uh, too much. I think that there's also an opportunity because the federal government is not uh, uh, one that we can rely on to push for the clean transportation, clean energy agenda. I think there's an opportunity for the states to take a bigger role. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're advocating for with the state legislature and, and with, with counties as well, mm -hmm. is that it's time for you to step up and, and take a bigger role. So uh, specifically when it comes to like electric vehicles, uh, in the last five or six years, we've seen battery prices drop from about $950 per kilowatt hour to about 150. Mm -hmm. So about five or six times cheaper in a five or six year period of time. So uh, electric vehicles, most people, have, uh, traditionally they have been quite a bit more expensive than, than traditional cars. That's uh, becoming less and less the case. Mm -hmm. So you can actually buy an electric vehicle for you know, uh, a reasonable price compared to, to comparable models that are, are gas powered. And then uh, the price of operating a car because electricity is a cheaper fuel than gasoline uh, it's, it's cheaper to actually own it. So I think uh, m more and more every year, uh, it's, it's no longer going to be a decision between driving a clean car and uh, saving money. I think it's going to be, they're going to be both in the same camp. You can save money and save the environment at the same time. Uh, and there are more and more electric vehicle models coming on the market, uh, especially this year. Uh, we're kind of at the end of uh, what we call the, the Generation 1 of electric vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, and we're stepping into Generation 2. Generation 2 vehicles, really starting with the Chevy Bolt with a B, uh, we're going to see the driving ranges go from about 100 miles to well over 200 miles on a single charge. Mm 
uh, and the prices are coming down to, to a very reasonable level. So I think over the next few years, we're going to see a, really an explosion of, of EV adoption in Hawaii. And that's going to put a lot of strain on infrastructure. That, so that's why we really think there's a role for planning at the state level and with the utility level. How can we provide the infrastructure that's needed to support uh, the, the huge influx of electric vehicles that we expect to see in the next few years? Right, and uh, I really look forward to explore a little bit further, you know, on those uh, concepts and the, the planning aspect of it after our break, sure. which is happening shortly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. That's uh, Ian, social media manager here at Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks for tuning in. I'm sorry to break into your show. If you're listening on the podcast, thanks for listening, watching on YouTube. We appreciate the subscription, et cetera. Uh, if you are a longtime listener or viewer of Think Tech Hawaii, you would know that we are on every day, five to six hours a day, basically streaming stuff that's happening here in Hawaii that matters to everybody worldwide, basically. There's a lot of stuff that we got going on, and we're excited about many of them. 2017 is going to be really cool. But right now, I can tell you that we are on iTunes where you can listen to all of this stuff now. We're really, really excited about how that's going. And we have just started a uh, on the street feature where we take a camera out to the street and stream live to you guys out there and getting what people in the local community out, what they want or are thinking about and sharing that with you. Um, we're really excited about all that stuff. We're really excited about you guys watching and following us on all the social media sort of things, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Look for us, Think Tech HI. Watch us on Olelo. Thank you so much. Our, everybody here appreciates it. Hello. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo, and uh, we are going to start our second part of our segment on climate change and Blue Planet Foundation's green transportation uh, energy. So, Shen, so we were talking about um, the entire process of creating a vision, but also the infrastructure for the much needed changes that we uh, need as a state to be able to achieve our goal and to become less dependent on fossil fuel. 100% right. goal of not being dependent by 2045. You know, many states think that this is quite a bold and, and unattainable. What do you have to say about that? Uh, well, I have to say that they're wrong. Um, there's a lot of skeptics about the achievability of 100% clean transportation. And uh, I think that um, our vision, so Blue Planet Foundation, we, we actually run a program called STITCH, or the Sustainable Transportation Coalition of Hawaii. It's a coalition of a bunch of stakeholders that are interested in clean transportation, mm -hmm. uh, and we are kind of administer the program. Uh, so STITCH, we've, we've kind of set out a, a, a two-part vision of what clean transportation or sustainable transportation is by 2045. And the two components are, first of all, we uh, envision that by 2045, half of all of the trips in the state will be by alternative modes of transportation. So walking, biking, public transit, uh, other mobility options like um, Uber, Lyft, or autonomous mm -hmm. uh, taxi technologies, which are being developed. A and a real scaling back of the personal automobile, which takes a lot of resources, uses a lot of energy and a lot of space, and also, um, a, a heavy reliance on the personal oil bill has some real equity challenges for low-income households mm -hmm. and also for the you know 35 to 40 percent of the population that doesn't even have driver's licenses so we really want to see an increase in alternative modes and and the quality and availability of them mm -hmm. uh, to th that really reduce energy usage and also solve a lot of the traffic and equity issues that we have in our current transportation mm -hmm. system and then the second part is is as I mentioned before we talked about uh, transitioning all the vehicles to renewable uh, energy sources. Mm, right. And uh, so I'm going to touch base on a very controversial sole issue for the state of Hawaii, which is our sure. railroad. <laughs> sure. So, so some people are adamantly against it. Some people say this is the only way to go. Right. Uh, so I would like uh, for you to elaborate a little bit on uh, where is Blue Planet Foundation at with uh, the railroad and uh, if you support it or not, what's your argument for or against it? Uh, so 
there's a lot of controversy around the project, and most of the controversy has to do with the cost of the project. Uh, so obviously it's very expensive, and the recent uh, increases in, in costs are you know, alarming and, and are cost for concern. Ultimately though, um, we really believe that it's important to have a, a very uh, healthy mix of transportation modes. And uh, really the cleanest uh, and most cost efficient modes of transportation are walking and biking. So that's where we really, that's the, that's the, the holy grail for sustainable transportation is walking and biking. And uh, to do that, you have to build neighborhoods that are walkable and bikeable. That means you have services and jobs within walking distance or biking distance of people's homes. Mm -hmm. Um, Larger sidewalks, exact, and bike lanes, exactly. that, and, and laws that respect the bicyclists. Right, right. Yeah. The problem is you can't really build neighborhoods like that unless you have a really robust public transportation system. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about public transit as just something that you add on top of something, that's a accoutrement, right, to our current transportation system, then it's easy to understand why people are really upset about the cost of the project. Mm -hmm. Uh, we like to flip that upside down and say, no, the, the public transit is really the backbone of our entire city, mm -hmm. not just transportation, but also our land use. Right. Uh, we can't build walkable neighborhoods without a really robust public transit system. Mm -hmm. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that our current public transit system here on Oahu, the bus, has really been at capacity since the early 1980s. Uh, it's, it's a little bit um, technical. But essentially the main problem is that in urban Honolulu, uh, the, the buses get so backed up behind each other, not so much the, the other traffic, although that complicates things, but mm -hmm. it's really the buses are getting in each other's way. And so the buses in urban Honolulu tra average about four to eight miles an hour. It's very slow. And so it's really difficult for the city to add more buses overall because all the buses get stuck in urban Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And so the, the rail will really help that problem by, by clearing out urban Honolulu and really providing a very efficient way to get people in and out of urban Honolulu, which will make it a lot easier to provide better bus service all over the island. Uh, and there's really no way we can increase our current public transit capacity without the rail project. And so, uh, but because it's expensive, it really doesn't make sense to just build the rail and expect a very small shift from cars to transit. Mm -hmm. uh, you really have to, because it's so expensive, you, the, we feel that the city and county of Honolulu really should go all in. So go big or go home. Go big. Actually, go big, not even go home. Right. There's no way back. That's you know, right, yeah, go big. So, so what that means essentially is, is we, right now on Oahu, about 6% of all trips are by public transit. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that number should be north of 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, about 76% of all trips are by personal automobile. We'd like to see that below 45%, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. trips coming into urban Honolulu. Uh, mm -hmm. And we really... Uh, I think that we can actually be able to say that the, that the rail project can't solve uh, tra uh, uh, traffic congestion. We actually think it can. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how many people you switch. Mm -hmm. And the city and county has a lot of tools actually that can get people to switch from cars to, to alternative modes. Mm -hmm. The rail is essential to, to make that possible. Uh, but it's not the only tool in the in the toolkit. Right. So let's talk about those all the tools in the toolkit that people sure. don't think about it. So biking, right. renting a uh, car by the hour, perhaps walking. Right. Uh, well, so the way we think is the best way to do it. Uh, I think the best example of how to do it would be to look at a city like Vancouver. So in the late 1990s, Vancouver as a city set a goal to by 2020 have more than half of all this, the trips in the city be by walking, biking, and transit. Mm -hmm. And then they coordinated all their land use and transportation policies all towards that single goal. So they built really high quality bike lanes, they built high quality sidewalks, they mm -hmm. expanded their already fantastic public transit system, and then they supported things like car sharing, bike sharing services, mm -hmm. uh, and then all the developers when they came in to build projects the city required them to include amenities that made it possible for people living in those neighborhoods to walk and bike to grocery stores and restaurants and stuff like that. So they, they had a really holistic approach mm -hmm. and the city and county of Honolulu really needs to do that. Uh, they can't really do that without the rail project because the, the limiting factor right now is our, our capacity in the public transit system. Right, and um, I think most people don't realize that, and so that's really something to consider. What would you say uh, to people who 
have two, three cars <laughs> at home and say, I'm not going to give up, you know, my car and I'm not going to use public transportation. Right. Uh, because I think there is a part of like the re-education and uh, helping people understand the parks and the advantage of right. doing the switch. What would you tell to someone who's very resistant to those kinds uh, of changes? I think there's a really, uh, I think there's a fallacy out there that's very common misconception that people think that culture or people's attitudes about cars mm -hmm. is what is the primary thing that dictates their behavior. Mm -hmm. And all of the data suggests that's not true. So if you took 100 people from Honolulu and you stuck them in Tokyo, or you put them in New York City, uh, you would find that almost all of them would be getting around by, by walking, walking and taking the train. Mm -hmm. The biggest single factor that, that dictates how people get around is the built environment and the cost structure. So if we build cities where it's possible and convenient to get around without a car, uh, people actually tend to, to twi switch pretty, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is it's really hard to make those changes. It's really hard to improve bike lanes. The King Street cycle track is a really good example. Um, the mayor has said several times that the most controversial thing that he's done during his administration has been the King Street cycle track, even more controversial than the rail project. And that's because people are very resistant to anything that, that uh, you know, cuts into their, tr their, their vehicle traffic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's understandable. We've built a city where we, we have so many cars that we've taken every square inch of the, the street. Mm -hmm. And so it's, a conge it's a congested and it's contested space. And so we can't really improve the bike, net bike network and the pedestrian network without taking away from the cars. Right. And so it's, it's natural we're going to have some, some, some pushback. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important that we fight back against that pushback because really there's no other, there's really no other solution. We can't sustain continue, it we can't continue it to expand the roads. Exactly, it's impossible. Exactly. Well, you know, and also I think that's the part of uh, looking at other places that already have taken that leap mm -hmm. and they're doing so much better than we are and right. say, hey, if they can do it, so can we, right? Right. So we have a few minutes left for uh, our show, unfortunately, but I would like to cover uh, some of the activities that uh, Blue sure. Planet Foundation has uh, planned for mm -hmm. Earth Day and also around uh, uh, green energy uh, efforts you know, for this month and the following months. Right. So what's exciting and what's happening in the so coming weeks? The biggest thing is um, uh, actually next Thursday, uh, the, 20th the 20th of April, we're having a huge rally at the state capitol. So it's our clean energy day. It's a rally for 100% clean ground transportation. Uh, we have 700 uh, uh, elementary, middle, and high school students that are going to be coming to the capital. 700? Over 700. Are they coming from all over the state? Uh, or well, from I think Oahu? mostly from Oahu, but there may be some from other islands. I'm not sure exactly. Wow. Uh, but we also have about 10 vendors that are going to be having booths in the, in the capital rotunda. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some of those are the Hawaii Bicycling League, Bike Share Hawaii, um, a few others. Uh, that just share information about clean transportation alternatives. We're also going to have an electric vehicle ride and drive event. So we're going to have a Tesla and a Toyota Mirai and a Nissan Leaf and BMW i3 and, and others that uh, anybody who has a driver's license can come and actually test drive the vehicles. Um, it's going to be from 10 a.m. till noon. Uh, and it's, we're going to have some speakers, Representative Chris Lee and others are going to be speaking about, mm -hmm. about uh, clean transportation. And all of this is is basically building support and showing the legislators that there is a tremendous amount of public support for setting this 100% clean transportation target. Right. Well, that's amazing. And it's so wonderful that 700 children are planning to do this. They get it. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they really do. <laughs> and uh, are any other events that uh, you are uh, scheduled to you know, uh, well, we, we, ha well, we always have a number of EV ride drive events around the state. Uh, we don't have any planned at the time, but at the, at the present time, but we do about uh, one every month and a half or so. We're planning to do our Electric Island Drive again this year. We did uh, one last September where we had individual EV owners basically uh, drive through urban Honolulu in, in a mm -hmm. caravan with flags, and, and that was for uh, National Drive Electric Week. Uh, so we're planning to do that again this September. Uh, we have our, our annual fundraiser in September as well. And we, we do a lot of uh, community events throughout the year, but those are the, right. the, the big ones. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Shen, for being here and for being such an amazing, inspiring leader. 
uh, to help us, you know, move to a new era of uh, green energy, you know, for our states and hopefully a leader for the rest of the globe. Uh, well, welcome to uh, uh, Perspectives on Global Justice. Uh, this is Beatrice Gantelmo. And uh, uh, please come back next Friday and check us out again. Uh, who we hope.